Around this time last year, I checked out the demo for Immortals of Avium. It was a game I'd heard a little about, being pitched as Call of Duty, but with wizards. And as someone who enjoys shooters and was dying for a good battle mage game, I decided to give it a try. The game was a lot closer to Doom with Magic instead of Call of Duty, but the demo was decent enough that I wanted to check the rest of the game out. The time for that has come, so join me as we take a stroll and see if Immortals of Avium is any good. The game kicks off with a brief text crawl and some narration giving us the background for the story. The Five Kingdoms of Avium have been locked in an endless struggle for the control of magic, though the Kingdom of Rasharn, under the leadership of the Magnus Sandrak, is close to winning. Oh yeah, just a side note, all of the people who can use magic in this setting are referred to as Magni in-game, so I'm gonna try to stick to that. Sandrak's the win-at-any-cost type, so the war isn't going great for the rest of the kingdoms. None of that matters for the moment, though, as it turns out the narration is all part of a play that our main character and his friend are using as cover to steal from the crowd. It seems a bit grim to me to be putting on a play covering recent events in a war that's been raging for thousands of years, but nobody seems to mind. With a little success and a fight caused, Two characters slip away into the night for the tutorial and proper introductions. Through the dialogue, we get to learn about Jack and his friend Luna. Jack's your typical street urchin type. He's easygoing, preferring to shirk any kind of responsibility beyond making sure his adopted orphan family is taken care of. Luna is the more ambitious of the two. She feels like it's time for her to move on and try to make something of herself, so she's decided to join the army. Both have a little magical talent, but not enough to make proper magni of themselves. On a personal note, I have to say I love the setting for this first part of the game. The city where our characters live is built on the supports of a massive bridge spanning a bottomless pit, and while they live in the poor part of the city, there's still so much color and personal touches from the other people that live there. It really gives the whole place a lived-in, believable feel that a lot of fantasy cities don't manage. After a brief tutorial section, we actually get to meet Jack and Luna's adorable orphan family. One of them did get seriously injured while out on a job, so the older two need to scramble to find a way to heal him. While they're doing that, the army from the intro invades, and exactly the thing you expected to happen when I mentioned that they had an adorable orphan family happens. Luna doesn't take that well, and after she goes over the edge, neither does Jack. Once all the enemies are taken care of, Jack gets picked up by Kirken, played by Gina Torres, who is quickly becoming a regular on this channel, oddly. She offers to train him in his newly acquired magic, which leads into our second tutorial level. While Jack's learning to be a soldier, let's take a look at the gameplay. I mentioned earlier that Immortals of Avium is closer to Doom 2016 than it is to any of the Call of Duty games. What I mean by that is it's a game where the movement is fast and fluid, you're constantly switching weapons to deal with different situations, and if you're anything like me, you're jumping around like you just developed an allergy to walking. Your arsenal consists of three colors of magic, though it may be more useful to think of them as your guns, and there are three different varieties of each. Blue magic is your rifle. The standard form is a high damage, single shot spell with long range, and the other forms trade ammo capacity for more damage. One form can even zoom in like a sniper rifle, but personally I never found that one particularly useful. Green magic serves as your various automatic weapons. All of the versions have more ammo than the other two colors, but deal less damage per shot. I never got much use out of the basic form or the one that shoots tracking bullets. The machine gun, however, was a lot of fun to use. There's a brief period where the bullets fly randomly before they focus on what you're aiming at, so it's not super great if you have something right in front of you, but it can absolutely shred anything that stands still long enough. For the situations where something is sprinting up to say hello, you have red magic. Red is either your shotgun or your grenade launcher. The basic shotgun does exactly what it says on the tin. It has very little ammo before you need to reload, but it does a good job of clearing out anything that invades your personal space. I never got the hang of the grenade launcher form myself. There's a tricky little delay on the explosion, and the bullet travels in a straight line instead of an arc. But I imagine there's somebody out there who absolutely adores this thing. The third form of the shotgun has the highest damage of any magic in the game, which it tries to offset by needing to reload after every shot. I say tries because I never found myself in a situation where that was actually a problem. It just always clears the way, and the game throws enough enemies at you that it was always a treat to use. Speaking of enemies, the Rasharnian army has a wide variety of foes to throw at you. Most of the time, you'll fight your basic melee and ranged enemies. The melee enemies always loudly announce their presence and run towards you, so they're never much of a threat. Ranged enemies come in two varieties, blue and green. 
The blue enemies can be a real threat if they catch you off guard. Their attacks have long range, decent damage, and they're always more accurate than you think they're going to be. The green enemies throw grenade spells at you, which can be a problem if you're not watching where you're going. Eventually, the game adds in blue support units that shield other enemies, magic elementals that serve as stronger versions of the basic enemies, big blue guys and big red guys, and enemy magni of each color. The magni actually start out as mini-bosses before becoming recurring enemies, and are probably the hardest enemies in the game. Of course, the keen-eyed among you may have noticed that all of the enemies are different colors, which ties into an aspect of combat that I feel the game doesn't emphasize as much as it should. Enemies are actually weak to magic of their color. You learn early on that shields of each color can be broken by the corresponding magic. For example, blue magic versus enemy shields, red versus armor, and so on. But even aside from that, each enemy takes so much more damage from spells of its color than others. It becomes very important later in the game when you're facing off against a pack of enemies that'll feature a Magnus, some elementals, and some basic enemies. Of course, color matching isn't the only thing you have to turn the odds in your favor. Fury spells are big, flashy attacks you unlock as you progress through the game that range from essential with things like the Vortex to useless like the rock throwing one. This game also features some light RPG mechanics. There are upgrades for each color of magic that can buff your spells or your defense in a variety of ways, along with gear of varying rarities that you can equip. Your gear mostly increases your defense and your damage, but higher level pieces can actually change the way you approach combat. As an example, late in the game I got a few pieces of gear that buffed the damage of my Shatter spell to the point that it became a key part of my build for a while. And there might be other things out there that enable even crazier builds. Once you finish the game, there are dozens of optional challenges, and several hidden bosses you can take on for even better gear. The game even features a New Game Plus mode, so you can try out all your new toys. It's always nice to see that in RPGs like this. Aside from combat, some of your spells can also help you traverse the world. Early on, you're given the Lash spell, which pulls small enemies to you, or pulls you to large enemies if you're feeling like going back to the last checkpoint. It's a useful addition to combat to deal with archers, but it really comes into its own when you get the ability to use it to pull yourself to grapple points. Suddenly, the game opens up vertically both in and out of combat, and each of the other two colors gets their own spell that helps with progression. Every area in the game is chock full of puzzles and platforming that you need upgrades from later in the story missions to solve, so the few times you do actually need to backtrack, don't feel tedious because you're always finding something new. Between the combat and the exploration, it really feels like the team sat down and thought through how everything that they were adding could be used for both. And when everything's firing on all cylinders, the game can be a treat to play. Not everything is quite so positive, unfortunately, so now let's talk about the story. This game's story doesn't have any real surprises, and I'm not going to touch on every story beat, but there are some things that I do think are worth talking about. If you've played a game or watched a movie at any point in your life, you'll have a pretty easy time figuring out where things are going. But if you want to play the game knowing as little as possible, go do that now and come back. Don't worry, we'll still be here. The first issue with the story is that it trips right out of the gate. Well, I'd actually consider the intro mission a strong way to introduce Jack to the audience. The tutorial mission following it ends with a five-year time skip. Jack has spent five grueling years as a soldier and is, at least personality-wise, a totally different person than the one we spent the first hour or two getting to know when we meet back up with him. And while I know that time skip is meant to allow one of the later twists to develop and for Jack to get comfortable with his new abilities, I really feel we should have had a mission or two just to see him adjust to his new life, rather than jumping already to the point where it's routine. Jack's goal now is to join the Immortals, the elite force of the army commanded by Kirkin. He's qualified for the selection process, assuming he survives the battle he's about to fight in, and during the battle he gets kidnapped by a dragon and finds out that Sandrak's right-hand commander is in the neighborhood doing something shady. That something shady happens to be recovering an artifact from the temple of an ancient, magically advanced civilization. Unfortunately, he's not able to recover it before they manage to escape. Despite all of that, Jack is able to rejoin the battle and turn the tide, meaning it's time for him to get to selection. The Immortals are where the second big issue with the story crops up, namely that the game has no idea what to do with most of its characters. Aside from Jack and Kirkin, there are two Immortals that are major characters. Devin feels like a character out of a Marvel movie in that he talks a lot without saying anything meaningful, and I'm clearly supposed to find it funny, but I don't think any of his jokes actually landed the entire time I played the game. 
Zendara, on the other hand, is a strange one. She starts as your standard, hard-nosed, traditional sergeant type of character. About two-thirds of the way through the game, she reveals that she has a superstitious side, and I'm guessing the writer liked that more because that becomes her entire character for the rest of the game. The first person you talk to when you get to the Immortal Headquarters, Orfe, is set up like an important member of the team, but they're actually never mentioned again after the second time you talk to them. Another character you meet later, Kenzie, is also set up like an important member of the cast, and sure enough disappears after just one mission. Or at least she did for me. I suppose it's possible she'd have stuck around for a while if I'd done this conversation differently, and maybe someday I'll play through again to find out. Jack's own character arc is one of the few character things I can give the game credit for. His transformation from the cocky, magical prodigy to mature and responsible savior of the world is actually paced very well and handled exactly like you'd want to see from a story like this most of the time. There are a couple times where he makes decisions that are intended to move his character arc along, but feel very off for how he'd been acting up to that point. But I'll take a B-minus character arc over disappearing before you can do anything interesting any day. The villains in the story fare a little better than the heroes, but not by much. Sandrak himself changes personality three times over the course of the adventure. The first time you meet him, he channels his inner Raoul Julia. She didn't have to. Your men killed my family. Did they? I have no memory of that. The next couple times you meet him after that, he acts like he's a victim who's only lashing out at the people who wronged him the only way he knows how. This might have worked if it was in a different story. By this point, it's been revealed that the Immortals hit Rasharn with what is basically the genophage from Mass Effect a few decades before the game started. The problem with this is that the game opens with an account of Sandrak burning prisoners of war alive, something he never actually denies, I might add, which does make him hard to sympathize with at best. The last time you run into him, he's apparently decided he's in a Final Fantasy game and needs to kill the god of magic. It feels like the writer never quite managed to nail down what his motivation actually was, which is not something I thought I'd say about a character who's a ruthless, warmongering dictator. On the flip side, the Hand of Sandrak is easily the more interesting of the two main villains, though I probably don't need to tell you it's actually Luna in disguise. She was saved from her fall into the bottomless pit by the Rasharnians, and over the last five years has done a complete heel turn. Around the time the game reveals it's her, she and Jack have a mind spell go a bit off on them, which allows them to talk to each other even when they're in completely different countries. I did not have a Last Jedi reference on my Immortals of Avium bingo card, but the conversations they have about what the war has cost them, and why she's okay working with the people who killed her family, are the best written in the entire game, so I'll just let that slide. The story pivots direction just as often as the characters do. It is at different points a war story, a race for a MacGuffin, a treasure hunt, and an apocalypse story. Which is not to say that a story can't be more than one kind of narrative, but if it's not handled very carefully, it can leave things feeling unfocused and scatterbrained. If you've played a lot of Final Fantasy XIV, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But that's a video for a different day. Between the constant shifting of focus and the way the characters drop in and out of the story abruptly, honestly, I had started to suspect that the plot was written with the use of AI by the time that I finished the game. After reading a number of interviews with the writer, Michael Kirkbride, I don't think that's the case. The story was clearly a passion project for him, and more than one interview I found talked about all the time he spent hashing the story out with Brett Robbins, the director. As I read the interviews, I was put in the mind of a similar story I read years ago. I'm going to guess most of you don't remember the movie The Last Witch Hunter. It's a fairly unmemorable film, but around the time it came out I read an interview where it was stated that the screenplay came about after Vin Diesel was telling the writer about his D&D character, and the writer was apparently so inspired by the idea that they made a whole movie around it. Immortals of Avium's story feels like the video game equivalent of that. Two friends spitballing ideas and then cramming as much of it as possible into one project. Honestly, with all the different plot ideas and the game's 14-hour runtime, I genuinely think they could have broken this game into two shorter, more focused parts, and the whole experience would have been better for it. As you might imagine, and very unfortunately, the game failed. The estimates I can find is the game only sold about 53,000 copies, which translates into $2.6 million of revenue against a $125 million budget. 
That's not the biggest failure in recent gaming history, but it's still a massive failure. I'm not an expert, but releasing a $70 a copy game in one of the strongest years for gaming that I can remember probably wasn't a smart move, which is something that in later interviews the director and the writer did acknowledge. But even on top of that, I barely remember seeing any marketing for this. I only found out about it myself about a week after the game's release. There's also the small issue of the game being made in Unreal Engine 5. Now, my computer isn't a top-of-the-line machine, but it's also no slouch, and yet it struggles to run the game well. And that seems to be a pretty common experience based on the Steam reviews. So, all things considered, is Immortals of Avium any good? Yes, I, I think so. If it had had more marketing and come out in a weaker year, or even just launched for $40 instead of $70, I think it would have done just fine. And there's a lot of fun to be had in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, especially once you have your full kit. But it is held back by an unfocused story and characters that are so unmemorable, even the game forgets about some of them. If you can pick the game up on sale and you like this style of game, give it a shot. I think you'll have a fun time. I'm sure I'll come back and give it another spin myself somewhere down the line. The funny part for me is that the game is the missing pillar for that hypothetical game I pitched back in the Mercenaries 2 video. A game with Mercenary 2's faction and airstrike system, Immortals of Avium's more fluid gameplay and traversal options, and a version of Lichdom Battle Mage's spellcrafting could be amazing. Or it could be a complete mess with too much going on. The magical part about game development is you never know for sure till you try. Either way, it's time to put this one to bed for now. By the time this goes out, we'll have just had Thanksgiving here in the U.S., and I'll always be grateful for all of you fine folks who come here just to listen to me talk about my favorite hobby. I hope you get plenty of stress-free quality time with the people you love this holiday season. And be sure to tune in next time, where I'll be laughing at a silly game with some old friends. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you in the next one.